<coughs> okay, so I might get started. Yeah, no one, good. No one's introducing. I'm Alex Jordan. Um, I'll introduce myself. Uh, I'm part of, of course, this cluster um, and the, and the, uh, the Max Planck Institute, um, which I have called the Department of Collective Behavior because I didn't know yet. If, we're, we're legit? Okay, for the Max Planck Institute of Animal Behavior. Yay! Um, <laughs> And so today I want to talk to you, um, I'm going to give you a case study um, on, a, on a particular <coughs> uh, piece of work that came out recently, um, which like a lot of my work and certainly the way that I like to do it, was a bit controversial um, and highlighted some of the sort of elements uh, of animal behavior, of studying social behavior, of studying collective behavior um, that can be a reason and a cause for disagreement. And then some techniques that are emerging and certainly that we're pioneering um, in, in the broader uh, uh, sort of cluster um, and in the institute um, that might allay some of these concerns and help us get to a point where we can discuss these things, um, argue over facts and not just about our feelings. Um, and so this comes as, as a study in the context of broader questions that we have in, in our lab about the evolution of behavior, about the evolution of social behavior, um, and, and this interaction between cognition um, and, uh, and what it may require to be part of a broader social unit. Um, and so we've studied things like transitive inference, social memory, social recognition, um, but the study that I'm gonna to talk to you about today is this one about the potential, at least, for self-recognition um, in fishes. And this came about because uh, for a long time I've been studying cichlid fishes, this particular group of uh, animals, um, which are very complex socially, um, but also display a great many advanced and complex uh, cognitive skills. And so there's this question centered around the social brain hypothesis um, that being in a social group requires the evolution of specific or, or particular uh, cognitive um, and, and social abilities. And so in that context, we had done a lot of studies like these. Um, uh, we were interested, this is, this is way back in my first postdoc, to see just how far um, we, could, we could see this, this signature of cognition and uh, social evolution. And so we were trying to find the sort of pinnacle of cognitive abilities in animals. How, how, how advanced a, a task could uh, these social fishes perform? And it brought us uh, to um, what some people think is a sort of gold standard or the upper echelon of cognitive testing, which is the mirror test or the mark test or the Gallup test. Um, and this is a test relatively simple and elegant in its design where an animal is uh, furnished with a mirror in its enclosure or if it's a human, a mirror in a, in a room um, or if it's a child in the enclosure, hopefully, um, and then given a mark somewhere on the body that can't be seen except with the aid of the mirror. And if the animal, or human, or animals are humans, attempts to interact with itself rather than with the reflection, this is an indication that the animal understands what the mirror is doing, that it's reflecting self. And in the original uh, architecture of the test by its inventor, this was taken as evidence of self-consciousness, of theory of mind. It was taken as evidence that the animal understands that it exists and that this reflection represents itself and therefore that it is self-conscious. This is the interpretation of the test or was the interpretation of the test certainly when it was designed. And over time uh, it's been employed and, and demonstrated in other animals. Here is a, uh, not a complete, but a selection of some of the uh, animals uh, that it has been demonstrated in. So in chimps in the, in, the, in the early 70s and in human infants as well, um, obviously I'm jumping many decades here, um, but then we get to things like dolphins, um, one of two animals tested in 2001 was, was uh, accepted as passing the test. Monkeys, Asian elephants, one of three, the elephant's name was Happy, um, and the Eurasian magpie, two of five. Um, if you can tell I'm being a bit facetious here, it's because these sample sizes are typically very, very low, um, and often the test is relatively poorly performed. Um, and yet, in many of these animals, that's still taken as good evidence that they are self-aware and self-conscious. This is not particularly um, controversial, these kind of statements. 
Um, but also what you might see is that as time has gone on, especially with the inclusion of um, some uh, birds, the suitability for the test kind of decreases because this test requires that the animal performs a task that we interpret as self-directed, as attempting to remove the mark. Now, in a primate, that's relatively easy for us to make that extension. It's exactly the same kinematic structure of behavior that we ourselves would perform. In fact, it's identical. With uh, something like an elephant, it's also pretty easy to understand. The trunk comes up and interacts with the face. This is sort of equivalent to what we would do. But it becomes very challenging as we move out into the sort of uh, complexity and beauty of, of life to also have that intuition and empathy for these animals and understand that what they're doing is self-directed. Now this is true in the test, but what I'm going to talk about today is that this is perhaps generally true as researchers studying non-human animals, this difficulty with interpreting behavior or at least agreeing on what we're seeing. So as I said, whoa, speed talk. Um, as I said, um, I was interested in, in particular in this group of fishes called the cichlids. Um, these are a fascinating uh, group of animals for many reasons, one of which is that the, the lakes that they live in have been referred to, Darwin's, uh, referred to as Darwin's dream ponds. Because the idea is, or the suggestion is, that if Darwin had known about these things, this, these cases of repeated evolution from very few uh, progenitor species, it, this would have been his sort of dream system. Because what we have in these lakes is uh, this, this massive adaptive radiation of different morphologies, different uh, life histories. But in my case in particular, what's interesting is these different social systems. So we have these group of fish that are pretty much identical across many aspects of their ecology. They eat the same things, the same things eat them. They live next to each other in mosaic communities at the same depths, in the same locations. They, they face almost all the same ecological problems, but some of them do it solitarily. They only come together for the act of mating. And some of them live in these permanent social groups. Now you, you notice as well that I've put these terms in inverted commas because this is in fact something we're very interested in studying. Not putting labels on social systems, but actually un understanding the complexity of these differences. Nevertheless, I was interested at that point in understanding whether, for instance, this social animal was better at all these cognitive tasks, including the mirror test, than these non-social animals. Because that would be evidence, perhaps, that sociality has driven differences in cognitive uh, abilities and behaviours. These guys failed the test. They did not do anything that gave us a, a, a belief that they were attempting to remove the mark. This study, that demonstrating that cichlids cannot pass the mark test, sailed through review. No problems. Everyone was happy with that. But we were not happy with that because it's not clear why an animal might not pass this test. It may not understand what the mirror does. It may not have theory of mind. It may not be self-conscious. But similarly, it just may not give a shit that there's something on it. It does not care. The, the entire sort of uh, ecology and behaviour of the animal has to be centred around perhaps noticing in terms of its sensory system, but also having the behavioural repertoire and interest in the mark. Otherwise, we can't really make this, uh, this argument that it is not self-conscious if there are alternative pathways. And so that could have been happening or they could have just not understood the, the system. But we wanted to just extend that out a bit further um, and ask, would there be any other fish, since we were already on the question, that, that would uh, be better suited to this mark test. And it brought us to this thing. This is the cleaner wrasse, Labroides dimidiatus. It's a marine fish. It's very intelligent um, and has all kinds of wonderful traits like tactical deception, Machiavellian intelligence, memory of past interactions, selfish behavior. A lot of the work um, is done by Redouan Bashari in Neuchâtel. Um, but the great thing about this in terms of the mark test is that its whole life history and, and ecology is centered around detecting and removing parasites from the skin of client fish. So it can clearly see small discolorations on the surface of the skin and it cares for want of a better word. It has something in its behavioral repertoire that allows it to respond to these marks. So we thought, well, given that it's socially complex, given that it's got a lot of these con uh, cognitive abilities, and given that it's got a sensory ecology that, that lends us to believe that it could see and care, um, we wanted to test 
this fish in the mirror test. So this is what we did. The mirror test is characterized by having three prephases through which all animals or test subjects must pass before you give them a mark. These phases are taken as sort of evidence of uh, the understanding of what the mirror condition does um, and this process of exploring the body and this contingency testing of, of seeing, well, if the reflection does this when I do this, then perhaps therefore that's me. So let's talk about those. First is aggression towards the mirror reflection. This is very common response in animals. Um, there's some really cool YouTube videos that you should look up if you're ever bored of when they put up these big mirrors in the forest, in the jungles and things. And then, you know, baboons and, and big cats and all sorts of things come and smash these mirrors apart. And it's, it's really, really quite exciting. Um, many animals never get past this. Um, in Australia, at least, uh, I don't know about here, but you often have birds attacking the mirrors incessantly. Um, it seems that they, they treat these things as, as a territorial intruders. Uh, so they, they certainly uh, respond in this aggressive phase. As I say, some animals never pass through it. But for the mirror test, they must pass through this phase first. Then they get to this phase, the second phase, which is called mirror testing or contingency testing behavior. This one is hugely important in the context of the overall discussion today because this requires that the test subject is doing something that is, by definition, in the context of the test, unusual. It is a behavior that they're performing that we take to mean that they are doing something out of the ordinary to see if the mirror does the same thing. This is the contingency phase. In humans and in primates, that's relatively easy to understand. It's very strange facial expressions, this sort of thing, turning around, standing on your head. It's things that we consider unusual behaviors. They're not in our normal repertoire. But this becomes very problematic if we're trying to decide what is normal for an animal because if we're just using our intuition and our empathy, that may be very, very challenging if we have no empathy or intuition for the animal inherently. So this is a particularly problematic phase in the context of extending the mirror test out into the rest of the animal kingdom and it's something we'll come back to. And then we have this third phase, which is perhaps not as problematic, but still is problematic, which is the exploration of the reflection phase. This is when, for instance, humans would look at the mirror to explore parts of their body to see what they're wearing, perhaps, that they cannot otherwise see. Yeah, we're, we're, we're using the mirror as a tool to see elements or, or areas of our body. Now, again, in humans and primates, pretty straightforward. They have gaze directedness. You can see where they're looking. But what about a fish like an animal, which has a 270, what did I just say? An animal like a fish that has 270 degree or, or more or less, uh, a field of view and may have no foveated region. So it has no center of attention. Its visual system may not even be like that where it can focus on something. Um, how do we then know that it's looking at a particular area of its body? These, these questions become uh, challenging, more and more challenging as we move out from the, the, the subjects for which the test was originally designed. Okay, but let's just have a look at what this looks like for our fish. So we have two conditions here, the mirror condition and a conspecific control condition. Originally, we did not have this condition, but as you're gonna find out, this uh, had a pretty exciting time in review, this paper. So we have all sorts of controls um, that I'm happy to talk about um, to control for, for the sort of results we found. Um, but uh, this is the classic condition, and here we have another fish across a clear glass divide. Yeah? So it's controlling for these responses being purely social and nothing to do with recognition. So we see a quite a clean trace of this initially high aggression. Uh, this is a amount of minutes, number of minutes out of, the out of 10 minutes in which they're being aggressive towards the mirror. So on the first day, it's almost 100% of the time they're attacking the mirror. I'll show you what that looks like. And then down to day seven where we no longer see aggressive interactions with the mirror. In the conspecific condition, it's different. Um, but we see very, very low uh, levels of aggression all throughout, just the, the occasional display. Okay, so at least here, first, uh, first phase uh, satisfied. Then we have this second phase, mirror testing behavior. So here we have, uh, by our definition, 
all of the behaviors qualitatively that we never saw in any other condition. We never saw these behaviors in fish normally swimming around in their tank. Yeah? They were unusual in the sense that I just described. They were idiosyncratic in the sense that some animals did one type, some animals did another, some animals did another, but they didn't all do all of them. And they were repeated over and over and over. Those are the three terms that describe contingency testing in other animals. So they were satisfied here. And also they were coincident with a reduction in aggression. Okay, that's also part of the test. We did not see any of those behaviors in the social condition. I'll show you what some of these behaviors look like in a, in a, in a moment. And then we had this exploration phase. We were very, very cautious about making such statements that they're exploring their bodies. So this is simply the amount of time that they spent within five centimeters of the mirror in postures that could reflect their body if that's what they were looking at. Yeah? So it's postures that would allow them to see their body. Yeah? We could not extend it beyond that. And so that's also, uh, in terms of the behavior, satisfying the conditions of the test. Notice here, you see uh, a very, very different signature. And that's because in the real condition, the, 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 the social condition, they were interacting frequently uh, over the divide. They were coming close to each other, displaying, performing all sorts of behaviors. However, none that satisfied these conditions. OK, so let's have a look at what some of that looks like. Aggression, very, very easy for us to understand. The, the fish is attempting to bite the reflection. And this goes on, um, as I said, for about, for about a week. Then we have things uh, in this contingency testing phase. So one of these behaviors is this upside down swimming. This is very easy to interpret that this is unusual behavior. It's also repeated and it was idiosyncratic, but it's unusual because a fish swimming upside down in a normal open water context like this is about an hour, maybe two hours away from being flushed down the toilet. This is not within the normal behavioral repertoire of this animal in this kind of condition. And when I showed these videos to some domain experts, for instance, Red One, he said that in, in his 20 years of studying these fish in the, in the wild, he's never seen um, a fish swim upside down like this. So there we can be pretty satisfied. But there were other behaviors that were far less obvious that we didn't see in, in other conditions, but things like rapidly moving towards the mirror and then backwards, this sort of diagonal waving swim, something that, that I disagreed with, but, but my co-authors insisted on calling a quick dance where the fish is sort of wiggling its tail along. This is, well, this is the point of the talk. So we'll come back to this, okay? Anyway, so that they, they, they passed through the, the first three phases. Ah, oh, here we go. I've got to, I might just give up on this thing actually, because that's going to keep happening. They passed through these phases, um, not all of them, but the ones that did pass through these, these three phases, we then provisioned with the mark. Okay, and this is, has to be a modified mark because in a normal condition, in a normal test, it's just paint on the skin. These are terrestrial animals, right? That, that makes a lot of sense. Or in the case of the birds, it's a sticker on the, fe on the feathers. Can't do that with a fish because they live underwater. So any pigment you put on the body will either be dissolved or because it's on the mucus coat of the animal, a coat that's designed to slough off things that, that land on the skin, it'll just be sloughed off in, in a matter of minutes or hours. So we had to do something a little bit different. Um, and that was to use elastomer uh, tagging, which is a marking method that's very, very common in aquaculture and in fish research, where we inject a small colored mark just below the skin. So it's effectively like a small tattoo. But this, of course, introduces the potential for tactile stimulation as well. The animal may feel this procedure. Um, interestingly, again, I've never had the comment that fish feel pain in any review process, except in this review process. Um, I think it's a very important point. I think fish do feel pain. I think that has great ramifications for our fishing practices and all sorts of things, but we can discuss that over a beer. Um, but we have three conditions. First is the, the no mark condition, yeah? This is just the, the basic control for having uh, a mirror in the tank and the rest of the things changing. We have a sham mark phase where they are injected with the vehicle, the polymer vehicle, but no pigment, so it's transparent. So if there was some tactile stimulation or irritant that was causing a change in behavior, you would see it here. 
And then we have the colored mark, um, which is of course the same vehicle, but now with the pigment. Uh, and we inject it in, in three places, below the throat and on either side of uh, the head. Um, we later discarded uh, the head marked ones because we couldn't A, be certain that they can't see that directly with their, their broad field of vision. Of, one of three places, not all three places. Correct, one of three, it, yes, correct. Um, and so ultimately we had five of these individuals with a throat mark. Um, we discarded the others. We since repeated the experiment with 10 more, so uh, 15, and we're, we're well, hopefully soon uh, going to be repeating it even further um, here uh, as well. Anyway, um, and so these marks were, were oh, that's right, uh, were made to look uh, superficially like um, uh, an ectoparasite in, in the terms of their size and the color that they were to try and uh, ensure that these things could see them and, and make care. Okay, so then the first thing we want to do um, is just check for any unintended um, uh, effect of the marking process. And so here we're showing uh, all of the posturing behavior um, that reflects effectively the unmarked location. So if this procedure just made the animals care more about the mirror, there was something going on um, that they just spent more time associating with the mirror, we would see uh, it here. Now just to be clear, we have E2, that's the control I told you about. E1 is the prephases. We have E2, which is the control, E3, which is the transparent sham. E4 is not shown. E4 is colored uh, mark, but no mirror. So because this is interactions with the mirror, we obviously don't have any data for E4. And E5, which is the, the mark test, the, the mirror and the, and the mark. Yeah? We, see, we see no change in behavior there in terms of posturing. But if we then look uh, at the side that would reflect the mark, if that's what they were looking at, we see a significant increase in postures that would allow them to see the mark. So they're, they're posturing in the correct orientation um, after, the, after the mark test. Um, but of course this is, well, this is in fact the extent as far as the dolphin study went, um, and that was accepted as evidence of self-awareness in the dolphins. But we want to go one further um, and, and ask, can we see any of these key behaviors, this removal attempts? And of course, in primates, easy to interpret and understand, but what would a fish do to convince us that it was attempting to remove something from its body? It doesn't have the limbs. It doesn't have the ability to do that equivalent behavior. But luckily, fish do remove things from their bodies uh, quite frequently, and they do so with this, uh, it's called glancing, scraping, or flashing behavior, where they'll quickly, well, slowly move up to a surface and then accelerate quickly and, and rub their body on that surface. Um, this is a, a common behavior um, that you see in the wild and in tanks uh, uh, relatively frequently. And so we were looking for this behavior. Actually, we were also looking for it in the context of this sequence of events. Um, but but this, this is the behavior that we're reporting on because this as well is a little bit hard to interpret. Um, you know, the sequence and, and how quickly that needs to happen. Okay, so we're just going to ask the question now. After we give the fish uh, this mark, does it attempt to remove that mark from its body? And uh, if so, when, in what condition does it do it? Um, okay, and so here is uh, what we're looking for. Again, E2, control, we see none of this behavior. This is throat marked fish. None of this behavior. E3, which is the transparent control, none of this behavior. So tactile stimulation alone is not causing this response. E4, which is the pigmented mark and no mirror, we see none of this behavior. And then in E5, in this case, I think we saw in total 56 instances of this behavior. We've since repeated that experiment in Japan with 10 individuals. Nine of those individuals uh, showed an increase. So we're into the sort of hundreds of, of instances of this behavioral output given the mark. Okay. Um, and then what does that look like? So here's face scraping. Just the ever so briefest contact with the substrate. In this case, they're doing it on the coral. And here's the throat there. Um, so it's subtle, I agree. Um, but what we're looking for is physical contact with a substrate. All right. So we have behavioral outputs that suggest to us that the fish is passing through 
all the phases of the test in some respect. Now, to this question, are fish self-aware? I'm happy to talk about that after or at another time. I don't want to spend too much time on that because the main point that I want to make here is that it is very, very difficult to interpret the behavior of this fish in the context of this test if we're asking a question about self-consciousness in the same way that we're asking that question for other animals, for humans and primates. Um, uh, and I think ultimately this fish does pass through the phases. It does do these behaviors, of course, as you've seen, but it's doing so in a very different mechanism. It's coming to understand what the mirror does, but it doesn't require any theory of mind to do so. I will be happy at any point to talk about that, but you can also read all sorts of uh, popular media articles about the controversy about this paper. What I want to do here is actually highlight that controversy and discuss the way that's changed my opinion of how we understand behavior and what we, what we do um, and, and look for some um, alternative methodologies which I believe that we've now found or I've found and that we're developing here um, very, very well. Okay, so this all started in 2012 when I started my postdoc um, uh, in Japan. We designed the experiments. Uh, we finished the experiments. I had then got another job, so we're almost a, or over a year now. We submitted it to science because we were feeling brave and clever um, and thought that this could engender some fierce debate, which it did. So it went to science and, it, and it spent a while in review and it came back. There was a split decision. Two reviewers loved it. Two reviewers hated it, like really, really hated it. Um, both of them signed it, uh, which is to their credit. Um, and they said that there were all these extra experiments that were required, all these controls, a conspecific control. We had to have a control for empathy where we uh, marked another individual and saw if the non-marked individual would see that and signal to the marked individual that it was marked. Sort of like we would, we would touch your chin if you had some mustard or if your fly was open, you know. Um, some quite full-on controls. Some of them were good. Some of them I don't think were so good. Anyway, we did all of these. Um, and, the, and the main problem was with this idea that we were misinterpreting the behavior. Actually, very recently, the, the, these, this interpretation has been described as a sort of Rorschach test. You see what you want to see. Maybe, maybe a fair point. Anyway, we did them and we resubmitted to science. Um, Sasha Vigneri went on holiday, uh, we had a different editor um, and it got rejected um, because of this problem with interpretation. By then I'd started here. Um, submitted it to PNAS, same uh, reviewers, they signed it again. No, see you later. In fact, the comments were things like, why are we even discussing this when we're talking about a fish? This is not possible. Yeah. Uh, anyway, submitted it to, to PLOS Biology. Okay, you might guess. Reject, resubmit, extra experiments. Same review has got it again. Um, and now we're doing, you know, even more. Uh, again, this problem with interpretation. Um, and resubmitted to PLOS Biology. I'm not going to say their names, but you might guess. Um, but then a wonderful thing happened. Um, the editor of PLOS Biology called me. Rolly Roberts. If you ever have the opportunity to interact with him as an editor, I thoroughly recommend it. Because he said, look, Alex, this is very, very controversial, right? If I got these reviews under any normal circumstances, I would not touch it. It's too hot. But in this case, I think there's a real opportunity here to discuss the test more broadly and to discuss some of these elements. How would you feel about it being accompanied by a primer, by Franz de Waal, um, who will basically say that your paper's, you know, flawed and crap and all of these things, um, but it would lend itself to a broader discussion about whether this test can even be applied and is it a fair test and how do we understand animal cognition and how do we interpret behaviour? Uh, and I thought that was really, really wonderful. Um, and so it, I, I believe now actually Franz de Waal's paper, paper is not actually that harsh on ours at all. It's pretty harsh on the test. Um, but so is mine, uh, or our paper, um, because it, it, it is a very problematic test if you're, if you're asking these questions. But this, oh God, this is the thing that I really want to focus on. At every point where it had trouble, the trouble was because of interpretation. People were saying, you are not seeing that. You are wrong. When we said that we saw an unusual idiosyncratic repeated 
contingency testing behavior, the reviewer said, no, you didn't. And that's a really hard reviewer's comment to come back from because these are literally the experts in the mirror test. They almost designed the thing, you might say. And so then it's my word against their word about what I've seen. And this is a huge problem because there's no way out of this. There's no data. There's no logic. There's no discussion. It's just in, in the way that we did this test, which was observational. Yes, we saw that. Them saying, no, you didn't. And that's impossible. And it gets down to this difficulty with understanding what an animal is experiencing and what is a response to the experimental condition, what is unusual, what is normal, all of these things when it's not another human you're dealing with. And it leads me to this quote, which I love, which is what is normal for the spider is chaos for the fly. Now, it's very hard to put subjective value or interpretation on animals whose umwelt you're not experiencing. And it's sort of, in my opinion, which was forged and formed over the six years, seven years, this thing was in review or, or process, luckily which, you know, I survived uh, through. But it made me start at that point and, and certainly to this day, and certainly I think this is what a lot of us are thinking about, which is this problem with behavior. You know, we live in an age of, of omics, genomics, transcriptomics, whatever you want, morphometrics, and behavior doesn't really fit well um, in that world, especially not qualitative behavior where an expert, me, is sitting in front of a fish tank, noting things down on a pen and pad, or worse, scuba diving, being nitrogen narcosed out of my mind and, and writing down what a fish is doing 30 meters underwater and then coming up and saying, look what I found. That's totally vulnerable to anyone saying, no, it isn't. You did not see that. It was the larium, it was the nitrogen, it was the depth, it was the fatigue, whatever. And that's a really problematic position because it prevents discussion, debate. It prevents useful and, and generative um, processes, in my opinion, in behavior. Um, okay, so, so yeah, as I said, unlike morphometrics, it can be very difficult to put numbers on behavior. It can therefore be tough, as I've experienced, to convince people of the objectivity of the data that you're presenting. And you know what? The worst part is I don't disagree with them. Yeah? It is very hard in that mirror test to be objective. So I think they're actually wrong to say that the fish didn't do these things, but they're right to question why uh, we believe that, but I'll come back to how we're assessing and addressing that. Um, and in the age of big data, open source, and in particular the reproducibility crisis or repeatability crisis as I've incorrectly written here, um, behavior is, is perhaps an uneasy fit in that qualitative way. So for the final part of the talk, I want to ask this question, can computational approaches to behavior help address some of these questions, uh, specifically in the case of this mirror test, uh, but also more generally in the case of, of our understanding of the evolution and, and, uh, and rules of interaction in social behavior and collective behavior. So this is the uh, essential uh, slide um, for many of our talks um, because uh, it's an approach um, variously called computational ethology or behavioral decomposition, um, but, but more generally this idea of quantitative behavioral analyses that allow us to use relatively recent technological advances to situate and quantify behavior and the differences in behavior in a context that allows us to display them and most importantly for me, debate and discuss them. And so this is uh, an approach that's been variously developed by a few labs around the world um, and, and recently uh, Jake uh, out of Ian's lab has, has um, uh, developed another methodology. We've uh, developed a way to do this in the field as well. 
Um, so a lot of people are now using uh, these kind of approaches and the beauty is you take some kind of input, whether that's some visual uh, information about a, a scene that you're video recording or some other data stream, and then you can break down uh, the elements, in this case of the behavior that the animal is performing, into these categories, which can be more or less uh, structured or defined, that this thresholding can be changed, so you get fewer or more categories. And then, at the final stage, you can describe what you think those categories are or group them in some nomenclature that perhaps you agree on, but perhaps more importantly, maybe you disagree on. So someone can come along and say, okay, this is idle and slow movements. Okay, maybe, well, when it goes up here, maybe you'll see what that is. But someone else can say, no, it's not, because look, 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 something, something, something. Point is, it's the beginning of a discussion about the behavior it's not the end point that you submit and then agree or disagree on. So then, with that in mind, let's move back to these, uh, these cichlids in this case and this question of the evolution of social and collective behavior. Because if, like, like me and, and, and my lab, you're interested in how social and collective behavior evolves, in what evolves, in what changes, it's crucial that you can define what is different amongst systems. So if I tell you that there's, we have this solitary animal and we have this social animal and social evolution has driven behavioral change, it's essential that we can point to a place that describes that behavioral change, what has actually evolved. Um, and so these kind of approaches allow us to put numbers on those differences uh, and have these uh, discussions and debates uh, about what has evolved. So I'm just gonna take you through the work that we're doing now and we'll follow up on with the mirror test to address this question of in this transition from a solitary to a social life history, what actually changes, what evolves and how can these methodologies uh, help us answer that question? So the first thing that might happen uh, is that behavior itself evolves. Yeah? And so here we have two fish interacting, um, being tracked, and I'm not going to go into any of this sort of tracking uh, approach really. Uh, you saw a lot of it uh, last week with Mate's talk, and, and basically this is, this is something we're now very, very good at in the group. But here you have what would probably rightly be described as an aggressive interaction between the green fish and the, the orange fish. The green fish attacks the orange fish. And this is a species called Lamprologus ocellatus. It's one of the non or less social species. And if I were being qualitative, I would say, I don't know, aggressive interaction or rush or bite. And then if I wanted to compare that to a social species, Neolamprologus multifasciatus, I would probably use the same terminology, rush, aggression or bite. And immediately I lose resolution on that comparison. Maybe I could see how frequently those behaviors happen. Uh, maybe I could see um, you know, the density at which you get the onset of these behaviors, but I would lose any quantitative resolution in comparative space. But with these kind of approaches now, with this tracking, we can render that interaction in any kind of uh, parameter space. So here we're looking at the first trace is the two speeds of these animals, the relative direction of these animals, and the distance. And so here we can, for instance, break down this interaction, not in terms of a qualitative descriptor or a label, but in terms of actual numbers of how this interaction is occurring. And perhaps we see some differences there. Um, and so in as far as we're interested in this comparison of behavior, we take two approaches, and, and many people do. The first is supervised, and then we have unsupervised behavioral classification. So this supervised approach draws more directly on traditional ethology. When we have domain experts, people that know about these animals, that watch these animals, look at a behavior here, and so you're gonna see here um, this, this driving behavior. Actually, this is a behavior we don't understand really the function of. It's used in maintenance and in, in shell digging, but here it looks to be a very social behavior um, and appears to be uh, directed at one of these individuals. But point is, if we describe this category of behavior and we label it, as, as many of my students do, we might then be able to see a, a descriptor of that behavior in some space 
that allows us to compare it, to say that it's different or the same as some other behavior. It's different or the same across species. It occurs only in the mirror condition or not. We don't just have the label, but we have some signature of that behavior. And so uh, Hui, who's in the audience somewhere, is currently doing this where he's, along with many other people in the lab, describing all of the different behaviors in traditional ethological approaches amongst these species and then asking out of some incredibly uh, rich um, parameter space which ones of those parameters are describing the different behaviors we see. And so then, for instance, if we have aggressive behavior in non-social animal versus aggressive behavior in social animal, we will see whether there's a different uh, structure of those two aggressive interactions, even though we might be describing them as the same thing, whether for convenience or because we actually don't see a difference. So in this case, we get uh, a much greater resolution on, underst on understanding uh, this, this, uh, the source of this variation or this evolution in behavioral space throughout this spectrum. The alternative approach is to use uh, these unsupervised methods, um, which I'm showing down here, um, and, and these, these harken back to that first figure that I showed you with the, the, the fly. And what this allows us to do is simply categorize everything that the animal is doing. We track it in some context, we track it throughout time, whatever. We track it with the mirror, without the mirror, with a conspecific, without a conspecific, in the lab, in the field, whatever you want. And then we can just map out, this is a one dimensional representation, the previous one was two dimensional. We just map out all of the different things that it's doing. Then, with the same approaches, we might see that a, a social species has six, seven behaviors that it performs routinely, and that's important, that routine part, versus a social species which may have 12, 15, 20 different behaviors that it, that it uh, displays. We don't tell it what those behaviors are. It doesn't tell us what those behaviors are. It just says there's this many different things going on. And that can be hugely useful for having this discussion about what's different uh, amongst these animals. Um, of course, this is not purely objective um, uh, because we have to choose uh, what kind of values and, and, and data go into these models. Um, but what it allows us to do is, for instance, look at, uh, at a group of interacting animals and look at what behavioral state they're in at any given time and then start to ask questions, for instance, as we do here, um, and as these two uh, master's theses presentations um, this week will we'll discuss, uh, how this interaction occurs. So here we just have a, a visualization of the behavioral state change of these animals as they move about in the world. And this is also a very important validation step because we can look at this, uh, at this uh, progression, at this motion, at these behaviors, and decide whether our categories are really valid according to our, well, domain expertise perhaps, or at least we can discuss and debate these things. Is it reasonable to have purple, pink, and blue in this thing, or do they represent actually the same behavior that's just an artifact of the way that you've binned them, that they, they appear as different categories here? Okay, so that's how we might ask where the behavior itself has evolved, you know? Is it in terms of the, the, the supervised categories that we see are actually different amongst the species? Or in unsupervised behavioral classificational space, are there differences amongst all these species? So we have these two approaches. But when we're asking questions about social and collective behavior, we have to, of course, understand not just the kinematic structure of that behavior, but what that behavior does or what it's for. And so then we can extend these kind of classifications out and ask if an individual transitions from state A to state B, what's the probability that another individual is affected by that transition and transitions from state B to state C, for instance? Then we get the sort of linguistics or, the, or rather the functional effect of behavior. What is the behavior for? What is it doing? Because it's entirely possible that behavior itself has not kinematically changed it's conserved. There is a conserved behavioral repertoire that all of the animals can do, but the effect in a group or in the network has come to change. And it's a bad example, and I, I, I hope you guys or someone can once one day tell me a better example, but the way I think of it is, if you think about the way that we say no versus the way that people from subcontinental India, for instance, say yes, it's a little bit structurally similar, but it has the opposite meaning. 
If there was exactly the same gesture, that would be the perfect example, but uh, I can't think of, of too many others. But this is what could happen. In one species, we could have this behavior being a threat, and in the other, it's a courtship display. We wouldn't see that in this kinematic space, but if we embed that in some, some sort of extended Markov chain, we may see those effects. Finally, well not finally, but as another alternative, we may uh, get this case where actually nothing has evolved in terms of the behavior or the meaning of behavior, but there are some kind of hidden interaction rules that change the way these social systems are structured in a different way. And so to explain that, here we have uh, a test where we have an animal choosing how close to be to a conspecific. Um, and we see that this animal has chosen to be really far away and this animal has chosen to be really close. In that simple difference, we would then get very, very divergent social systems, very, very divergent places on this evolutionary tree of solitary to sociality. But the only thing that's changed is the way that these animals interact and perhaps the distance over which they interact. So with these approaches, we can get all of these things. And the best part, the very best part, is that we can do it out in the world. And so this is what it looks like when we uh, are able to go out into the world where these animals actually live uh, and study these kind of interactions and analyze this uh, behavior. And I think we may have footage from, from our field trip in Corsica. So this is just a machine vision um, approach to detecting these very hard to see fish in very hard to work in environments. And that can be hugely important as well, because if you take a, a social species or a non-social species out of this context and ask what's different about their behavior, well, perhaps in a common garden experiment, nothing is different about their behavior. They become the same. Actually, Paul, uh, last year in the field, did that test, and they, they are not. They do preserve these differences in, in interaction. Um, but it's important that we ask the question in the context of where it occurs, because it may be also something about the environment that's, that's introducing some kind of different social interaction or forcing them to behave differently. So it's really important that we're able to ask these questions in the places uh, where this behavior has evolved, because of course, uh, the selective pressures are only really acting um, truly uh, in those environments. Um, and we get very good resolution. Um, uh, Paul and Fritz have recently had a paper um, about this technique and this methodology down to the individual tail beat and how they interact with rocks and one another and the behavioral states they're in. Um, so a very powerful technique. Okay, so we started out with this situation. Where we have a fish doing something in front of a mirror um, and just as the Douglas uh, Adams uh, book, um, you know, this, this is, uh, what's the quote? Generally considered to be a bad idea and pissed a lot of people off. Um, but it, what it did was lead us to, to lead me to this, this question of how we might resolve this conflict uh, any better. And so to tell you just uh, in, in concrete terms what we're doing, so you may remember Jan, he was a, a PhD student uh, in our department. Um, he's recently published this paper, um, Quantification of Abnormal Behavior. Um, and what we're doing now with an incoming PhD student um, is simply tracking and monitoring all the behaviors that these fish, these, these cleaner rats do when they have a mirror, when they don't have a mirror, when they have a mark, when they don't have a mark, when they have a conspecific, when there's a mark somewhere else in the tank, all of these things. And we can map that in some kind of space. And then we can say to people like those people that said you're interpreting it wrong, well, I'm not interpreting it. This is the signature of the change in behavior here. I'm not going to say what it is. I'm not going to say it's self-directed. I'm not going to say it's contingency testing. I'm not going to get into that argument. Or I, well, no, I will definitely get into that argument. But we can have that argument, right? They can say, no, it's not. And I can say, why? Why is it not? What is it about this that makes you think it's something else? And that becomes a very useful, I think, debate. And it also allows us to do this more generally. Oh, this is a bit, anyway. So here we might have this idea, this preconception about what these fish are doing based on traditional ethograms. Of course, I'm showing fish. It doesn't need to be fish. It could be anything. We then, with these tracking approaches, either with a supervised or an unsupervised method, break down all the behaviors we see. And then we can compare those behaviors, either, as, as has been done before, amongst the different species, as I mentioned, but perhaps 
More importantly, and this is the thing I'm really excited about, and I'm still trying to politically arrange this, we get different labs to score the exact same behavioral sequence and see where they, where their categories fit on this space, how well they align with some kind of objective methodology and how well they align with one another. Because then if there's debate and discussion, we can see where, where is the problem? What are we disagreeing about? What has sort of, in your worldview, what, does, what constitutes an aggressive interaction versus this one's worldview versus this one's worldview? Um, and, and sort of as a, as a microcosm of that, this is a sample of the ethogram of, well, you don't need to see what it says, of, of the fish that we work with. One of the labs in the world has an ethogram of 35 behaviours. One of the labs in the world has an ethogram of 19 behaviours. Our current ethogram, Etty, any guesses? Yeah, around, 15. around 15. So we have a, a serious problem because these are the labs that are reviewing our work and with whom we're trying to have a discussion about the evolution of behaviour. And if we can't even agree on what we're seeing, we have a massive, massive barrier. And so, as I say, hopefully I do convince everyone, I've convinced a few already, that, that we do this project together. But it could be problematic because it would perhaps invalidate at least the comparative power of 40 or 50 years of research. Anyway, I'm going to leave it there and, uh, and, and just say that I think we're at a wonderful uh, junction in, in the, the field of behaviour where we can start to incorporate these incredible technologies and these approaches to not just do what we were doing better, but actually to sort of revolutionise and, and change the fundamental way that we talk about and compare and disagree and argue and peer review and all of these other things reject each other's work. Thank you. So, any questions? Yeah, Gisela. Thank you. I, I completely agree with you on the quantification, of course. I'm just wondering, how do you deal with it when you have the same behavior that has different functions depending on the context? So how can you capture that in the um, Yeah, that's going to be Paul's PhD. Um, I, I think you're, you're really correct. Like, um, I didn't show because I don't want to spoil their... Uh, master's thesis presentations too badly. Um, but what we can do is ask, for instance, um, does the behavior that's expressed or the sequence of behaviors that are expressed in one condition, one social context, one in, in their case, whether there's predators around or there's predators not around, what's the sequence of those behavioral uh, events and then understand are they being used, for instance, differently. So let's say we have, yeah, uh, the, the, the fin goes up in, in, in one case, and when it's near the shell, no, I've got a better example. So, uh, Lucas, are you here? Yeah. So, Lucas um, studied the way that they dig the shell um, out. They live in these shells, and they have to unbury the shells and create this structure. And kinematically, what th many of the behaviors that they're doing there are for are to dig out the shell. Yeah? They are simply a maintenance behavior. Um, that is required. But in another context, they are social signals or they're threats almost. I mean, I, I don't have numbers on that, but many of the other labs would argue that many of these sort of um, entering the shell behaviors are threats to do maintenance in the territory. Now, you may have an intuitive sense that that's, that's correct and true, and, and it may well be correct and true, but with these kind of approaches, we could, for instance, say, that when it's interacting with this individual, there's a 60% chance that it does this behavior, and there's a 30% chance that then that individual changes state into a cleaning state. And therefore, you have a better inference that in that context between those individuals, the behavior is for a threat. So I think that's, that's the real power there. I would just like to sort of emphasize how important, I totally agree with you, how important this is. And some of you may have seen the scandal with Mark Hauser, <laughs> one of the most prolific, yeah. famous, uh, well-respected biologists in the world. Yep. 
And this all came down to interpretation of whether a monkey was looking one way or another. Right. right? And Hazen disagreeing with people in his lab, and it turned out that he was probably almost certainly being fraudulent for decades. Yeah. Um, yeah. And you know, just simply being able to track the head movements of the monkeys would have resolved all of this. And you could put that out, the, those data with your paper, yeah. and then it's, it's out there. If someone comes up with a new interpretation, a quantitative interpretation, that's fine. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, even in our own group, um, we have these discussions all the time. We look he at a, a video. Job. I mean, he was fired. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and, and so, like, Etienne and I and Anish and, and who else? Who we, you know, Jakob, we don't agree on these behaviors, right? We, and and, and uh, maybe a generation ago, or if I was Mark Hauser, I would say, you're wrong. I'm right. I'm the expert. But, but now we don't need to do that. We can say, well, what do you disagree on? Like, where, where is the difference? Um, I really like that. But so yeah, I agree about that. But then the, we still have the problem of the interpretation, especially if behavior is abnormal and it's at the end of the tail of the distribution. Then quantifying whether this is appearing more or less, it's hard. And also, I don't know. So you haven't answered whether they do have empathy, whether if a inmate has a mark, whether that would bother them, and whether they would copy um, abnormal behavior. So that if it does by chance do some sort of something that is not so. Uh, frequent, then whether it can see itself, whether that will amplify, so whether the, so I think the still the interpretation will still be hard. To yeah. In track the states. Yeah. Um, I, no, fully, fully, fully agree uh, that that you can never escape interpretation, and you can never escape description yeah. as a communicative necessity. Yeah. So we do need to eventually put labels on these things. Um, and, and try to fit them into some kind of broader understanding of the evolutionary process, for instance, or whatever it happens to be. Um, but that step comes last and it can be changed. So, yeah, and so, you know, what I compare it to is the way I did this 2016 study, I was in the field for three months, diving each day, watching what fish were doing, writing it down. And I got a, a, a network, that was compared across five time points. That took all that time. And if somebody said to me, ah, you know, th you, this edge wasn't there. Mm. Yeah, all right, like, what the fuck? I can't do anything about that. Or, or that I, 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 all of, as, you know, a good friend of mine, Michael, has said, you know, you're not seeing the detail that's there and therefore you're misinterpreting the whole system. There's no way out of that. Um, but with this, even if I did misinterpret it, even if my labels were wrong, even if I was saying it's unusual and it's not unusual, you're thresholding, binned it as unusual here, but it otherwise sh shouldn't have been, um, you, you can discuss that and, and really revisit it. And I think that's the power. Uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm really only you, of course, with the quantitative data, but I think that must be ways that you know, this person can convince. If, if not, then you know, that's a really big problem. So, this behavior must get habituated, right? Or if you inject this marker very early of the life, uh, then they, these animals used to it. So can you imagine that setting as a, as a double blind test, having, you know, the fish looks the same. Some of them are habituated to this mark, the other one is completely new. Yeah. And then you just, you just give this data set containing these two very different things and then ask them that, okay, rate, you should rate it if you think that this is wrong. And show at least there is a the interpretation will be hard, but still if you show the quantitative difference, yep. it will be the same as, as with machine learning that okay, you see in the behavior some difference in number, but then so if you don't accept this for example, yep. then you can't you, you could also say to the data that no, the machine is wrong. Uh, yes. Yeah, no, and in that sense I, I also fully agree. At at some point the categorization we get via machine-assisted processes um, is, is, is not objective and it's not true, right? It's, it's just a new microscope to look at the behavior. Um, and so in that sense, yeah, it's not so much uh, the categories that are infallible that no one could argue with. It would have to be that person going back and saying, I don't agree that this is whatever. And then the reason is because when you look at it, when you observe it, then there's something that, that violates it. At least we could then see where the signature of that is.
not necessarily in, in the TSNI space, but just in some kind of trace. Well, yeah, the scratching behavior was, you know, almost identical to some other normal behavior. Then, then that's a, a discussion, yeah, we could have. As you did the, the transparent mark, you could make a mark, which is like a grayscale, look the same as the normal <coughs> crystal. Then to, it's, it's not ha oh, no, we're doing it. We've, we've done it. It's happening in Japan. Uh -huh. Yeah, so we have, we have, yeah, exactly. Grayscale corrected uh, marks. We have, I mean, I didn't go into the behavioral stuff because I wanted to have this discussion, but we have controls like you, yeah, you can't imagine. So we're trying to behaviorally do it, but I think this is another way for someone to have the video in front of them, have our categories and say, ah, that's where I think you're wrong. I'd love that because, you know, just being told that I don't know what I'm looking at. So there's hope. There's hope, yeah. Well, I mean, one, one big missing piece that you haven't discussed is, is neuroscience. I mean, the, the, it's the, the neural activity that's generated behavior. Mm -hmm. And so it is possible to do whole brain imaging at cellular level, le level resolution increasingly. I mean, yep. you can do so with certain fish species. Um, you know, I've just been in Princeton and Bonn seeing the latest sort of free photon microscopy yep. or uh, ultrasound based imaging from freely moving animals. Yep. And so, I mean, surely that, not necessarily with this specific system, but surely that approach no, no, with this allow system. you to connect the, the levels. Yes, so um, once the permit is accepted, we have this proposed to look at the patterns of neural activity in a social decision-making network to see if in the mirror case it's equivalent to a conspecific interaction versus some novel object exploration. But that, but that would be sort of sacrificing the animal after an event. It so is, so that's because, real -time, real -time of course, and, and you're right, in this system I can't do it. Danielella, maybe. A system in which there's, there, there is the potential. Um, yes, this would be um, yeah, immunohistochemical staining, and patterns of activity, which is a correlated response in, in brain regions. Yeah, it's not ideal, um, but I fully agree with you. So a question that I often get, two questions is, one, why would this have evolved? Because animals never see a mirror, we can talk about that. But the second question is, um, if this test doesn't test for self-awareness, which I believe is the case, it does not test for self-awareness, how can you test for self-awareness in animals? And my response is, perhaps one day by neural imaging. If you can understand the link between patterns of neural activity and thought, for want of a better word, then you might be able to get closer to what this animal thinks is happening. So I do think the brain is, is the way because behavior as wonderful as it is, and maybe as you say, Mate, will always be, and as, as you say, Nat, will always be at some point interpretive and um, yeah, we're not the fish, so we, we when I gave my PhD, one of the professors said, the problem with you, Alex, is that you don't speak fish. Um, and I really hated that, but it is a problem. Um, in, in some way, it is a problem. Um, so I think in the brain, maybe we have an answer. Good, thank you all. Oh, Giovanni. No, sorry. <laughs> Any question? I mean, biology in, in many areas is totally limited by technology. Uh, and the sort of old style animal behavior was more limited by concepts you were arguing about interpretation, and now you're moving the, the behavioral analysis into a field that is again limited by technology. Because you can only quantify what you can sort of quantify by right. your automatic uh, vision things. In the end, I think we have to put these two together. Right. Uh, and there is always a something that you don't see. If you, if you image the brain with all the nuances and go into neuroscience, there are some limitations about what you see. Do you see the spikes? Do you want to say, see the second messengers? Do you want to see the cancer? So you're always limited by why, what you can measure. Or say in, in you look at fish and maybe the movement of a particular fin right. is important. Mm -hmm. Or the movement of eyes, if they can move the eyes, mm -hmm. is important. Mm -hmm. But your view of, of your images cannot capture that. Then you have to then go into the next step and create new images that will allow you to quantify that. So we always have to, to, to combine the, the approaches that are conceptual approaches to the, the technology. And, and But yes, so you're moving the field into a limitation by, by techniques. I agree. Um, and that's the reason that even the most computationally uh, competent people in my group are also in Africa for three months of the year so that they can be underwater, so that they can...
hopefully in, an, in themselves combine uh, the intuitive understanding of being an animal behaviorist, of being somebody that's with the system and maybe gets a sense of, yeah, the camera can pick up the, the, the shape of the body, maybe the fins, maybe not, but there was something else going on. I just saw this flash in the eye or I saw something and that can be a hypothesis generating tool that doesn't lead us down this same conceptual uh, limitation. So I, I fully agree. If we blindly trusted that our tracking approaches capture the entire system and that the whole system is described in the data streams, that's foolish. There is a place for, for traditional ethology and for, for field biology and for having a sense of the animal and, and, and the unknown elements of the system so that we can think about ways that we could know more or, or move that intuition into, into a data stream. But I totally agree with you. This, this technological approach is not um, the absolute solution. It's a new microscope, it's a new tool. Um, as Mate was saying, you know, the barn is, is effectively just a, a giant microscope. Um, yeah, but the two things cannot live without one another. But it's also not true, you know, I think Jake, maybe you said, uh, you don't like the term computational ethology because except for maybe Nick Davies, who goes out and, and watches birds with a notepad and pen, everybody uses a calculator or something. There's always some com computational, um, I'm sure Nick also uses a calculator. Um, but, uh, you know, um, but I do think this is a different sort of level of, of that uh, involvement. Okay, let's get lunch, eh? Thanks.